Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India In the previous lecture, we looked at uh, vertically integrated organizations and looked at their governance structures, uh, which is like functional, product based, and uh, it can be process based, it can be matrix, and so on. So, we gave several examples. In particular, we talked about two important examples, which is Zara, which is although vertically integrated, it is uh, it follows uh, uh, different lines of. Um, of business and a highly successful company in the fashion industry. Uh, the other one is Semex, which is a cement company. It is business model is to supply business uh, building materials rather than just cement. Now, what we are going to look at is networked organizations, which are basically organizations of groups of companies which are under independent ownership. So, Basically, a number of uh, independent companies, each concentrating on its own business, form an alliance towards a specific goal, performing activities along the value chain, acting together as a single corporation. It is as though it is a single corporation, but one is doing the supplying, another doing the manufacturing, another distributing, another retailing, and so on. So. They are all, it is a sequential process that is followed and all of them are collaborating to uh, towards the success. And partner selection, coordination and control are three parts of uh, the governance of the global value chains. When it becomes important uh, to, to look at the governance when you have so many independent companies. So, somebody produces cotton, somebody does sewing, somebody produces jippers and so on, but who will put them all together? Who tells them uh, to what zipper for what? Is it uh, is it for a trouser? Is it for a shirt? Or is it for a coat? Whatever. So basically, one need to find out depending on the design, depending on manufacture, and so on. You have to select the partners and coordinate their activities. Who does what? And also control them whether everything is going right or not. You have to monitor and control for quality, for the price, for everything that goes that goes wrong and so on. So that becomes an important this one. What is coordination? Coordination in, uh, involves deciding and keep uh, uh, this one like product definition. What is the kind of product? If you are producing uh, shirts, what is the design? What is the uh, what is the color and so on? So basically, specification, technology to be used and production schedules and location, quality systems, labor mix, environmental standards and targeted price and communicating to the partners. So, basically everything somebody has to do this and then coordinate, tell, tell to the partner. It is. So, this kind of coordination is needed in network organizations. In vertically integrated organizations, there is a under, uh, it is authority, somebody a design team of the organization decides it's approved by CEO, CEO gives an order and everybody follows. But here you have independent organizations, so that is where coordination becomes a bit risky. So here is a picture of a network structure of a government company. So you have all the suppliers around the world, somebody does the design according to the, this one and there is advertising and marketing and the distribution and so on. So, this is a typical uh, this one. So, there are two kinds of network governance mechanisms uh, 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 that integrates multiple autonomous diversely scaled parties to create complex products or services meeting time and quality requirements. So, what are the network governance? There are three types of governance structures generally. One is what is called hierarchy. Coordination and control of production related to the activities is internalized to the form. In other words, hierarchy is like a vertically integrated form. The other one is markets. 
you know just leave it don't coordinate anything you leave it to the markets and markets independently produce the parts in other words if you are if you are producing uh, jippers you go and market it whoever buys buys it or you take an order from somebody and then uh, you uh, you uh, basically go and sell it but there is no coordination here in the network structure interactions takes place through networks of companies engaged in mutually supportive actions one party is depend on the resources controlled by another and their gains to be held by pooling of the resources so we are talking of a network structure where which is sequential and they collaborate and cooperate and so on so this is not either markets or something it between comes between hierarchy and markets network governance is a distinct form of coordinating economic activity which contrasts with markets and hierarchies so that's about about the theory of this uh, which uh, between the, the hierarchy and markets and the networks come in between so there are what are called integrators in this integrator is either a, a original equipment manufacturer or a proprietary technology owner um, or a financier or a trader who basically does a develops strategy conceives a winning products and coordinates workflow among all the parties trains the human resources and helps in the event of trouble well these are the kinds of functions that uh, one need to do and that's what the integrators does so auto manufacturers such as chrysler use their buying power and size to their network's advantage right so basically their advantage is to sell the cars the network's advantage is to give everybody who is in the network their business apple uses proprietary technology as a leverage and protects itself through non complete or non disclosure agreements and moving rapidly to new technologies so when you are assigning or outsourcing something giving to somebody then there is a possibility of somebody stealing your your intellectual property how do you protect yourself from the intellectual property one of the ways is to rapidly change these properties i mean apple does moves from one product to other quite rapidly before somebody else imitates that and their financiers investment brokers have been traditional integrators and information owners like bookstores supermarkets chain stores their closeness to the customers they leverage their closeness to the customers they basically become the integrators sometimes the bookstores uh, uh, they tell the authors what to write a book and uh, and what topic and so on so benetton nike and crisco mark and spencer are best known network integrators outside the auto industry so there are other integrators in this so basically the idea is to, is to look at is, is there is somebody outside when it, there is a network one thing is to leave it to the market forces the second thing is there is somebody either inside outside who should tell people what to do and so on somebody who is who takes the responsibility for this so there are basically what are called channel masters i'm just introducing all the terminology which is available and then before i get into uh my own uh, this one so the channel master is an enterprise within a supply chain that has compelling control over the sales of products like for example general motors for daimler chrysler in automotive manufacturing top 3 automatic compared 73.7% of the annual vehicle sales so they become channel masters why are they channel masters why do people listen to them because they 75% of the annual sales are controlled by them so the suppliers and the logistics providers in the auto industry they because they they command respect from this coca cola pepsi and cadbury beverages and soft drinks top 3 manufacturers 80% of soft drink market dell computers commands the largest share of desk pcs cisco leading manufacturer owns electronic infrastructure of the supply chain and walmart mass retail biggest uh, customer account of most cpg companies requires vendors to operate and so on so basically these are channel masters they get the power from 
their market size or uh, their market share. So, th th this is just an introduction to, uh, to, to the governance we looked at the integrators markets and so on. Let us try to get into what is governance and how do you actually um, give some uh, theoretical underpinnings of governance and how do you model what is the mathematics that is used. So, let us look at some theoretical aspects of governance. What are the features of governance? Good governance this one. So, it identifies and manages relations with the government, trade, social groups, labor, resources and B2B and B2C logistics companies. Right. So, in other words, it is a network having say thousands of uh, companies. So, you have to identify the relations with the government, with other within the companies, with the trade and other social groups, labor and so on. And if you want resources, those resources. And it has to build the business models and relationships for growth enhancement. So, what is the business model? You are selling direct, you are selling through uh, this one or you do it everything yourself or you want to basically outsource some of this. Uh, what are the relationships that, that you want to have with other countries, joint ventures, FDI, foreign direct investment or you want to do something. So, there are several decisions that needs to be made. Build systems for effective communication, collaboration and coordination among the network partners. Everything that is done has to be transparent and shared among people. So, you have to have the, uh, the ways of communicating with people. Identifies and categorizes the risks of various ecosystem sources and puts in place risk mitigation strategies and operational readiness. Now, so, there I mean everything goes well it is fine, but there is there sometimes there is a the risk uh, of uh, uh, something happening from a truck failure as simple as that to some uh, earthquake in one of the supplier countries to uh, sovereign debt of another country and so on. Several things which are unforeseen can happen, high probability or low probability whatever events can happen. So, whenever these events happen you have to take care of them what is the put the things in place and for every customer order select the partners, allocate the tasks and responsibilities and form a network and ensures that labor laws environment standards are followed. You know there are uh, laws regarding women labor, the child labor uh, and so on and also you cannot pollute the atmosphere, the carbon uh, GHG gases and carbon footprint, these are all important things that one need to follow. And he has a control room for monitoring and execution of the planned activities in a timely manner uh, both normal and abnormal conditions. So, and a normal conditions to check the quality of the product and uh, abnormal conditions to check about expediting and doing other things and so on. So, these are all the features of a network governance model. So, you whenever whatever is the one you to suggest or whoever is the one who has to follow all this. And talents, so what are the talents that are needed? Can anybody be a CEO and all this? Deep domain knowledge. Now, you are treating of your uh, a network, you are considering a network which is globally distributed and it uh, it, was tech, it has to be technology enabled so that and also whatever is the vertical whether it is oil gas or steel or uh, auto or electronics you have to have deep understanding of the processes and also uh, intellectual property relating to the products processes and so on you should know. And management of procurement, acquisition, partner selection, monitoring, supervision, visibility across the supply chain of course relationship management. In other words, you have to have good relationship with your suppliers, with your distributors, with your retailers, with your customers, big customers, governments and all the resource suppliers like electricity, water, human resources, educational institutions and all that. I mean this is a huge, huge task. And capabilities to identify continually, redesign and manage processes to change market needs. 
Uh, this is an important thing, particularly if you are a technology oriented company, technology changes. So, as they change your products get uh, outdated. So, you have to think of new products and so on. And human resources training, mentoring and performance evaluation. So, these are the kinds of talents that are needed in the supply chain governance. So, let us look at uh, the global supply chain networks and inter organizational networks. Now, there are what are called social networks. Now, social networks are usually we study, we look at social networks like Facebook, LinkedIn and so on which are person to person networks. Now, all of us have accounts on LinkedIn, you are linked to one person uh, to the other. But what about companies? Can uh, the, the companies, all transport companies, are they on this or that so that they can communicate, they can exchange information of the state of the art, they can also collaborate uh, this one or all that. Is it a transport, social, transport, Facebook, this one, it is possible. But it is inter organization that is called inter organizational network like people's network is a social network. You have inter organizational social networks like uh, you have hospitals, small hospitals, big hospitals they link together. You have logistics companies, all the trucking companies and so on, the third party, four party logistics players they link all these people, the trucking, warehouses and all that and that becomes an inter organizational logistics social network and similarly supply chain is an inter organizational network. So, instead of persons you have organizations which are involved in the social network. So, in the global networks, network of companies forming a goal of this one inter organization social network with strong or weak ties. You know in a social network, you have two kinds of ties, either weak ties or strong ties. The strong ties are Karasu, Shabal and Gongshi in, in uh, these are all uh, strong ties in the sense the supplier and the manufacturer or the distributor and the manufacturer, they are basically having very close ties. In other words, the manufacturer invests in the supplier, it provides the intellectual property and probably the suppliers people are, are there in the manufacturing this one to find out the requirements and so on. So, there is a close relationship in the between, uh, between them and this is the one that is followed in several countries. And there are lots of advantages to, to this, you have a long standing relationship. So, trust builds up between these two people, so there is no theft of intellectual property and all that. But the strongest disadvantage particularly with so many disruptive technologies coming is the, the, outdated, the, the suppliers may soon get outdated, their products may become outdated. So, you either you have to train them to become update or update them or help them to uh, to become uh, to become modern and uh, and so on to maybe the new technologies or you have to move out so but the buyers may feel socially obligated for the partners so that means you are thinking that since you have a strong relationship you have to update them or still keep buying from them and so on and ignore more competent newcomers. So, that is one thing that usually happens particularly when technologies are changing so fast it becomes uh, almost it is like having a cottage uh, handloom versus uh, a machine controlled handloom uh, and so on. So, basically you uh, the, uh, the social obligation is one issue with strong ties, but on the other hand if you are buying from the market, well you have arm length relationship, in other words as long as somebody supplies that is fine. But if you do not supply high quality ones and if you do not have the technologies, then I will move to somebody else. So, this is the kind of a weak ties arrangement that you have and can severe ties if not competitive. So, what happens to the partners? It incentivizes the partners to be on the cutting edge cost of innovation otherwise they will be fired. So, when you are looking at this global supply chains from the perspective of social networks, 
uh, you get very interesting results. Because in the interorganizational social network literature, you know, which was basically concentrates on small linkages between small hospitals, big hospitals, and also the educational institutions uh, and so on, they are called loosely coupled systems. But here, when you apply it to supply chains, it gives you interesting results. So, you have either strong ties like the Japanese model or a weak ties that is it is entirely up to the market. If you are not competitive, I won't buy it. It is like buying it on the web or uh, through an exchange and so on. So, tension between weak strikes and talks right. So, what do I follow? Should I have a trusted relationship or should I have our month relationship? So, what do I do? So, that is a tension that people have to. There are three types of network governance that uh, uh, is followed. So, what is the network governance model? Highly centralized external broker. In other words, there is a fellow, I mean, Lian Fang is a, this one, well, I'm international in agriculture. He is highly centralized external broker. In other words, he does not own anything, any manufacturing or anything, he is not a part of this. But what he has is the connections, he has the connections with the retailers to get the orders, he has connections with each of these suppliers in each of these countries, he has government connections, he has connections to choose the logistics players, he has connections with the banks to get the financial help if needed any of these partners need. That is one model that we have. So, this is this is a highly centralized broker model or an orchestrated model that is gaining uh, importance now. And there is another one is participant shared governance model by electrical board, electric board. Healthcare is one example, this group of hospitals come together and they have a board with this one. Dairies usually because they are small. Uh, players as well as uh, this one and cooperatives are the ones where they have an elected board. They have lots of members who are partners in this, but they have an elected board which manages the entire thing. And a participant shared governance with a lead player. So, instead of an elected board, so one of them becomes a lead player like an integrator. So, either it then here there are two types, one is producer driven or buyer driven, producer driven or the manufacturer driven, which means that it is like Cisco, Nike or General Motors or something, where you have this producer driven uh, uh, participant governance models. And it can be buyer driven like uh, Walmart, Levi, Carrefour or something. So, these retailers basically are the ones who dictate to the, the suppliers what to do this and so on. So, basically these governance models are interesting of this. These are the three things that you have. All three governance forms are in practice. As I gave the as examples here, first of all the first question is are there, are there only these three, uh, this one in terms of the networks or there are others. You can search for others, but I do not think there are others. And which one is better? Is it possible to basically uh, either qualitatively or quantitatively assess in a particular situation which one should I use? Well, the answer is none are proved superior. So, what we are leading to here is what is called multi-layer governance coordination and execution. So, what is what is here is <coughs> the governance is what does governance mean? It is partner selection, coordination and control. So, first of all the supply chain is an inter-organizational network. A separate chain is formed for each order. So, we have basically the several of these suppliers and uh, the orders as the orders come we we choose uh, these people and partner selection is based on the structural features what are the structural features what is called ss 
asset specificity and second thing is the capabilities. Now, when you select a partner, now supposing you have a requirement that you should have separate uh, certain specific types of machines or he can have, he should have separate uh, kind of trucks which will fit a big boiler which some electric company wants to buy. So, that is called it becomes asset specific in other words and uh, those are the features that you should take into. Relational ties with the government, social networks, cluster management, etc. So, if you everything being equal, if somebody has very good connections, then you may choose them. And coordination, that is a partner selection has two features, one is structural and relational. And coordination is determining who does what, when, when and communicating to everyone that is mathematical and execution is monitor the order status so that the processes work as per plan and control exceptional events right. So, you have three things which is governor governance means one is partner selection based on the structural and relational features and of course, what you want whatever you want to do and third one is coordination determining who does what and when and having good communication with others and execution. So, these are the three things in the in the governance. Let us look at what is the partner selection. Now, how do you select partners? Usually, the partner selection if you in the ordinary case, how do you select partners? It based on low cost. Now, somebody says 11 rupees uh, and somebody else says 9 rupees, you select the 9 rupees one. That is the cost issue. Then there could be other issues that are that are needed. Supposing you can add the transportation cost. If somebody is far off I mean the product quality everything being the same, then if somebody is in China and another fellow is in, is in India and if the manufacturer is in India, then you source from India. The, that means, then you are worried about unit cost plus transportation cost right. Now, if you are if you are basically getting either from China or from Taiwan or from or from Hong Kong, then you add the duties on this and also the shipping times. So, what is the kind of safety inventory that you need to keep? And what is the uh, uh, the kind of uh, uh, distribution that the travel time has? So all these things matter. And what is the kind of infrastructure, delivery infrastructure that uh, they have at that particular port? So the issue becomes complicated. It becomes based on the ecosystem. So the transaction costs are costs incurred to coordinate connect all the links to the global supply chain and transaction costs related to finding suitable trading partners, negotiating, setting up the contract, monitoring the compliance with the selecting partner. So, basically all these costs will come in. So, transaction costs include observable costs which are what are the observable costs? Transport, import duties, customs tariffs and other formal trade barriers. That is what I was talking about. There are also hidden costs like information gathering, negotiation and monitoring contracts, trust building, networking, risk handling, mitigation, making up for cultural differences and miscommunication, compliance with safety regulations, labor laws and so on. So, there are all the soft costs that come. So, the hard observable costs decrease with trade liberalization. The observable costs are transport costs, import duties and so on. If two countries have uh, 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 some kind of a, uh, uh, a trade pact, so then the trade costs can come down, the exchange uh, this one, but the soft costs may increase. So, the hard observable costs decrease with trade liberalization and decreasing transport costs, the soft costs of social connections gains importance. 
So, but usually people don't, they look at only hard cars, but uh, they are brokering and other cars and risk handling and other cars, people do not do not take it, but it is important to take both hard as well as the soft cars while getting the EC partner selection. So, what are the transaction cars? Three cars of transactions affect the, the three characteristics of transactions affect the cost. One is what is called asset specificity. And second one is uncertainty and third one is the frequency. I mean frequency is easily explainable, how frequently do you need it? You want it only once or you want it every week? So, if the frequency increases then you know that is a, a is a thing that you should, it is not a once in a lifetime kind of activity, but it is a daily activity or a weekly activity. And also uncertainty is what is the uncertainty that is involved in terms of the cost, in terms of the practices, in terms of uh, the economy and other things that matter a lot. And also the asset specificity for the particular product under consideration. Are there any asset specific machine structures you need? Do you need for example, if you want R&D, you need specialists say in biotech you need specialists in software engineering. So, all these things cost cost money. So, basically you have to look at those and transaction cost economies TCE theory. So, the, the TCE transaction cost economics theory says when transaction costs are low use the spark market governance. In other words, you can easily connect to somebody who is the best supplier for you and you know what is the cost of transportation and all that, you can evaluate when it is low, you use the spot market. When transaction costs are high, hierarchy is efficient. In other words, this is transaction cost is used as a as an example to, uh, to find out whether you want to outsource or do it yourself. So, if the transaction costs are high, that is outsourcing is expensive do it yourself and if the transaction costs are low then use your outsource do not do it yourself. This is the kind of thing that is used, but then it depends what is the transaction cost? Is it the unit cost or is it unit plus transport cost or is it the unit plus transport plus uh, uh, the trade trade costs? or is it for the any pilfering theft and so on you want to add the cost. So, the, the, the cost evaluation becomes a bit complex. So, in between market and hierarchy there is the governance called structure called hybrid. So, three four types of uh, asset, uh, asset specificity. In other words, when you are looking of asset specificity, physical asset specificity refers to the mobile and physical features of assets such as specific dice, molds, tooling for manufacture of the product. So, a supplier, some manufacturer wants a particular product to be supplied from a supplier. Well, it is one of those products with the supplier already doing his the machinery that is fine, but on the other hand, it may be a new product and the supplier need to buy new machines for this. And if he buys that machine after if this particular product this disappears, this order disappears and he supplies it, it may the machine may be useless after that. And supposing you want to you want to have uh, some other uh, uh, warehouse or something which is asset specific, which is uh, temperature sensitive products and all that. And when this business goes away and that temperature sensitive uh, warehouse becomes a waste, so nobody else may need that. The other one is dedicated asset specific that represents discrete or additional investment in generalized production capacity in the expectation of making significant sale of the products to a particular customer. So, what happens is usually in a, in, a, in, in the in this development you expect supposing you are making a green product 
okay so when you supply this to the market and if the market accepts it then you have an immediate rise in your uh, uh, demand so with this so you can say this particular product since it is green people are going to buy it and you want to have asset specificity in other words you want to have capacity much higher than this third one is human asset specificity arises in learning by doing fashion through long standing customer specific operations in other words you want uh, for example the uh, uh, it companies used to have c++ programmers or photon programmers for this but those programmers once uh, now photon is obsolete and they may be useless afterwards and site specific uh, uh, assets refer to successive stages that are immobile and are located close proximity of one another so as to economize on inventory and transportation so basically you can you want to have a warehouse you want to have a supply hub and but what happens uh, you know if the market goes down and there is no demand for that particular product whatever supply hub you have had for this particular product whether it is automobile or electronics then it becomes a waste so this asset specific specificity is an important thing but there are various kinds so supply chain specific assets the other thing we are talking about is an important concept is supply chain specific assets good relationship between members of network or cluster assets such as specific dies molds and so on resources the human cluster clusters financial institutions ports etc institutions create benefits to companies in taxes and tariffs by creating special economic zones special universities for training manpower etc and delivery infrastructure ports airports railroads highways special trucks for carrying finished vehicles and heavy power plant equipment such as boilers temperature controlled warehouses refrigerated vehicles forklift trucks guidance systems and so on so some of these costs are not flexible or transferable across products or organizations infrastructure created manpower train cost of attracting 3 pls and software providers etc so the, the the point here is this what we are interested here is in this supply chain asset specificity or supply chain transaction costs so you have a supply chain resources institutions delivery mechanisms all these things give to cost so we basically based on the ecosystem we get the this one frequency and uncertainty frequency of interactions between the buyer and supplier is important because they create the economies of scale to recover the cost of specialized mechanisms created and establishing relations with partner network it's important to have scale if it is a one time transaction then your cost will be high but on the other hand if the cost can be the the capital cost or the sunken cost can be neutralized over a uh, uh, scale of several pro uh, product sales then it is different for transfer of trusted knowledge to customer exchanges environmental uncertainty can come from suppliers customers competitors and so on the mode of governance used to coordinate partners depends on the source of uncertainty high uncertainty recommends hierarchy so basically this so let's look at what are the transportation costs that how do you calculate in other words we said the transportation a uh, transaction costs are high then you either you do it yourself or uh, you know you go to the market and so on so first transaction cost is the the direct product cost production quality transport and so on that comes from the supply chain the second one comes from the delivery shipping inventory asset specific hard and soft infrastructure now the asset specificity comes from for the delivery 
as I said if you have a boiler which is which does not big the ship or the truck then you have to make special arrangements or special trucks and so on. And also the hard infrastructure is the uh, is the port, the, the forks, the, the, the forklifts and so on. The soft infrastructure is particularly in terms of delivery is the uh, is the connections and and so on. And the resources of course you have the clusters, humans, financial power etc. Now the clusters for example for electronic uh, this one they have they are, they are specific on on electronics or auto uh, and so on. So the human also if you are trained for a particular uh, job uh, then uh, you may not be you are vulnerable for once the, the particular company disappears and so on and the financial and power. And of course institutions which depends on taxes, tariffs, special economic zones, free trade agreements and social groups. All these things add up to this one. So we know that these are these four are the ecosystem parameters. But one more thing that adds is the coordination costs or the broker fees. Because to coordinate all these activities and have connections with all of them it requires the cost. So, you calculate your transaction cost. So, if you remember why are we doing all this? We are doing all this to select our suppliers. So, you go to the supplier and say what is the production cost? Where is what is the delivery cost depending on his location? What are the resource costs? And what are the institution costs? and what is the coordination fees and for each supplier if you have say um, uh, 50 suppliers oh, some in China, some in Hong Kong, some in India, some in Bangladesh and so on for each of them you can see these are different and so you can add this coordination and other broker fees and so on and get at the transaction cost and select with the lowest uh, with the low for this one. Once you selected all the suppliers and group them then you have to do the coordination is to coordination is to bring different complex activities or organizations into harmonious relationship. So coordination is for every order select the suppliers assign functions to them such as what to supply how it is to be produced and product tolerances, standards, etc., and the production and delivery schedules. Right. And identifying key parameters such as the product specification, the technology and quality systems, labor, environmental standards, along with targeted price, and communicating them to the chain partners. Ensuring all parties follow governmental and, and international organizational regulations on product design and manufacture for ensuring consumer safety, environment and child and women labor. So the, the coordination activity is basically he has to take the, all the international uh, regulations into account and it should be it should be followed because he, whatever happens this particular coordinator is responsible. And execution or online supervisory control is for example if you take a third fourth party logistics providers who are basically managing the end to end B2 logistics. They coordinate all services needed for goods transfer and warehouse at shipper and distributor ends arrange the trucks for all, uh, all through the journey, manages the customs clearance at ports or airports, loading and unloading, cross docking, merchant transit as required, manage all exceptions through control room, truck failure, truck registration, payments at customs driver schedules, expediting etc. So execution for example is, is one of the things that is the prime function of a logistics provider that is why I gave this example and a 4 PL or a 3 PL does all this but this has to be done for the entire supply chain that is what we as, as we see here. So the, the issue is you have three functions here one is partner selection that is you have for all the suppliers, manufacturers and so on you have selected partners at various groups. 
in various countries. For example, the supplier, this can be a group in China, this can be a group in India, this can be in Bangladesh and so on. And similarly, when you want to transfer, this manu manufacturing may be single or multi-site manufacturing. And you have logistics providers for B2B and B2C, the distributors could be all over, all over the world. And similarly, there is a logistics which transfers to the retailers. Retailers could be in US or in Europe or it could be all over the world. So what happens here? You in the partner selection, this one, you have selected all these people and then put them as groups. In other words, you have gone through or there are some kind of a certification procedure. And there are a lot of interaction costs that are involved in searching for them and then putting them all together, but you have them. So if you are if you are saying I want something to be done in China, I know these are the group of people who do who do it in China and so on. So and if I move want to move some uh, product from China to Singapore, uh, Hong Kong to Singapore or something, then I know the logistics providers. So this is an Excel sheet which gives you all the information. And while doing so, I have also calculated the transaction costs for selection of this. Now, for coordination, what is that I had to do? I had to select for each order the partners. So I select the partners for each order and based on their transaction costs, since I have all the transaction costs, I can select the one that is the, that is the best and then tell them what to do and and when what to do look at look at their their uh, uh, whatever facilities they have and so on and execution of course is control of this so what i have here in this diagram is a model for the governance of a global supply chain which involves all the three now whoever does this whether it is done by a broker or it is done by uh, a participant governor, buyer driven or uh, uh, or uh, 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 retailer driven, whatever you have, this, he has to follow all the three steps in this particular given in this diagram. So this is called the governance mechanism for this. So I mean frequently what is the question that is asked is what are the mathematical models for the design of the governance mechanisms. The partner selection problem you can follow as a fuzzy AHP or a, um, um, the, uh, a integer programming problem or one can rank order the suppliers for each component based on their ecosystem parameters on the TC. In other words, I have told you how to calculate the transaction cost economics. You can rank order them based on the uh, the transaction cost. And coordination scheduling problems can be solved using optimization techniques. These are standard uh, techniques that are available to solve this particular problem. But expert systems, station support systems, case-based reasoning and hybrid control systems are used for exception management and execution. execution is one of the things it is called what is also called real time control. In other words, you have this entire process, you have to visualize the process and try and execute the entire thing. So that becomes a very uh, complex thing. Usually BPOs, business process outsourcing outlets are used for, for this and one of the examples that we have is Genpac. It's an outsourcing company uh, in India, based out of Hyderabad and Gurgaon, and they do it. They monitor and do all the things uh, for the uh, for a company called truck company called Penske, which is you know out of U.S. So all the things, if there is a truck failure, they handle it from here. If uh, the the uh, <coughs> scheduling of the trucks for picking up uh, auto components from Minneapolis and deliver them to uh, to Detroit. How many trucks, who is the driver and what is the route that it is. It is all decided by Genpac. So the issue is that this kind of uh, this one, it will give you confidence into this one rather than just leaving it open. One thing is to to plan for things and think 
that everything happens according to plans, but most often they do not. So, it is becoming important to have this exception management and execution function into this that is called execution in the governance this one. So, uh, to, to conclude uh, we have uh, dispersed small players the service networks they require help in formation, governance, coordination, execution for efficient profitable product delivery. Now, what we are talking here is we have SMEs either uh, in, in apparel either on a twice making or, or anywhere or auto manufacturers and so on. So, basically they are all the players who require help in governance, coordination and execution and so on. So, the coordinator basically has to act as a mentor also. And we have to identify and manage relations with the government, trade, social groups, labor, resources, delivery mechanisms and all that. Somebody has to be in charge to talk to the government, to talk to various people and actually have these relationships which are becoming very important. Implementation of governance reach, sensor networks, big data management and cloud computing. There is lot of IT structure, IT infrastructure and analysis that is needed to make these things happen. So, this can be used to advantage in uh, small and medium enterprises, hospitals and cities, villages, etc. And theory development needs integration of social networks, interorganizational theory, machine learning, optimization game theory with supply chain networks. So, what we have done in, in, in today's these two lectures is we have talked about the governance. Governance means you have an organizational interorganizational network and you have to make them collaborate. Uh, how do you do it? I mean they do it within themselves by elect, elected board or there is a, a dominant player called the channel master who will coordinate the activities for the group so that everything works well or there is an external broker. So, we will look at this, but in some situations there may not be any governance of this. Now, for example, there is a small scale industry fellow, he does not know, he is not a part of this, but it is important he becomes a part of some global network for his business, otherwise he will become small, unsmall. So, basically this is a very, very important topic that uh, uh, this one uh, the governance models which is often ignored in the literature uh, both in the literature as well as uh, in the practice more in practice than in literature. So, what uh, we are going to do is in the next two classes is to look at uh, some of the examples the more detailed the orchestration models with practical examples and so on. So, thank you very much.